We're studying the book of 1 John, and we're in chapter 2. 1 John is the book of assurance. I've asked you to circle or underscore every time you see the word K-N-O-W. I hope you're doing that. And he tells us in the fifth chapter that the reason he wrote this book is to help us know that we are indeed the children of God. Now we have talked about four tests that we are to give ourselves to see and help us know that we are truly Christians. First test had to do with what do we do about our sins? How do you feel about your sins? What do you do when you sin as a Christian? That tells a lot about who you are as a Christian. And also whether you're walking in the light in your daily life or in and out of the darkness. Christians are to walk in the light, John says. Third test was the test of obedience. That is, keeping his commandments. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, we understand full well that we're not perfect. We're going to fail, and we do fail. But a Christian wants to do the right thing. Old-time preachers used to say, God fixed our warners. And even though that was the old-time way of saying it, it's still a good way to do it. Look at it. Okay. Christian wants to do the right thing. And if he falls, and he will, when he gets up, he's facing in the right direction. That's how you know you're a Christian. And the fourth test was, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? He said, you'll love your brothers You'll love the other Christians in your church family. And you'll know that you're Christians because you love one another. And Jesus said other people will know you're Christians because you love one another. Now, we come to the fifth test. And this test, we need to listen to. Last Wednesday night, we finished up about that loving one another. Now he's going to take a moment as a pastor and speak a word to his people. So look at chapter 2. Verse 12, that's where we left off. I write unto you, little children. Now, you're not talking about little children in age. He's talking about his church family, and he called them his little children. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. You are truly Christians. You've been saved. And I'm writing to you as saved people, my children in the faith. Look at verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. You know Jesus. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one, Satan. I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. This is a pastor now talking to his people, sharing with them his heart. I have written unto you fathers 
because you have known him that is from the beginning, that is Jesus. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong in your faith, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now this is the introduction to the next section. And here's how it unfolds. He's talked to them about these other four tests that we just talked about. Now he's fixing to bring up another test. And before he mentions it, he says, this is for you. You young Christians, the little children. You fathers, you young men. This is for you. I am your pastor. You are my children in the faith. And what I'm about to say to you, I understand full well what your situation is. You are Christians. I can vouch for that, John said. But you are always in a battle with Satan. And he said, I understand that. Now, there's another way to look at this passage that I just read when he mentions little children and fathers and young men. Some Bible scholars think that he's talking only about spiritual maturity. The little children would be young Christians. The young men would be some who have been Christians for a while. And the fathers would be men who were strong in the faith, having been Christians for a long time. I don't object to that. I just don't see it as being his main thrust. I think he's pausing in his letter to say to these people in his congregation, I know that you're saved. I know that you're Christians. I know you've been born again. But I also know that you have a constant battle with sin, with the devil, with the world. And I know that you need what the Lord alone can provide for you in your conflict with the world in which you live. Either way you look at it, it's still the same. He is giving encouragement to his church family and his concern for them in their Christian journey as they face the temptations of the world and the efforts of Satan to lead them astray. He's concerned about them. And any pastor, if he has a pastor's heart, would feel the same way about his congregation. So now we come to the passage for tonight. And it begins in verse 15. Love not the world. Test number five. How do you feel about the world? Now, I'll introduce the things I'm going to say tonight by reminding you that this has been one of the problems in churches through the centuries. Too many Christians who are worldly in their minds and maybe in their hearts and in their lives. I think one of the biggest sins in the church today is the sin of worldliness. We're going to see what that means as we look at these verses tonight. But he introduces it. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, he doesn't love 
God. See, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's start our discussion about worldliness by finding out what John means when he says, love not the world. What world is he talking about? Is he talking about the creation? That world? No. When God created everything, he looked upon it, and what did God say? That's good. And everything he made is doing exactly what he made it to do till this day, except one thing. And that's you and me. The one thing he made in his image is the one thing not doing what he made it to do. Everything else is doing exactly what he made it to do. The sun to give light by the day, the moon to reflect the sun at night, and whatever he made is doing exactly what he made it to do, except the one thing he made in his own image, and we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. But it started with the first man in the Garden of Eden when he thumbed his nose at God and said, I know what you tell me about eating that fruit, but I will do as I please. And man has been saying that to God ever since. So it's not the created world that we enjoy, the beautiful sky, the beautiful stars, the beautiful mountains, the beautiful streams, the things God made are here for us to enjoy. And I love this beautiful world. And I've had the pleasure of seeing a good bit of it. God's creation is not what he's talking about. Then there's the world of mankind, the created beings of every nationality and tongue and living in every part of the world. Is he talking about the world of mankind? No. The Bible says that God loves that world. Isn't that what John 3.16 says? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's not the world of mankind. Well, what is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. And when you ask questions like that, it makes me real proud to be your pastor. The world, as John is talking about it here, is the world of evil under the control of Satan in opposition to the will of God. So that's what you should have in your notes. He's talking about the world of evil over which Satan presides, and it includes everything that is in opposition to the will of God. The world that John is talking about first is a world you can't see. It is an evil and it is unseen. It's the atmosphere of evil that is under the control of Satan. So, the world that John says we are not to love is the world that Satan presides over. Now look at it another way. Satan has his emissaries in the world today to do his bidding. Call them evil spirits or call them demons. Satan presides over 
the world of evil. And he's working at it day and night. He's always at it. Because he is in an opposition to God and he is persuading as many as he can to join his world. Okay? The world that John is talking about is a system that is invisible. It is a system of evil and it pervades the life of man on the earth. Don't look at me like that. That's what it is. And out of that evil world that Satan presides over come the things that we see, that we know, or worldly things. But when we see worldly things that tempt Christians, they come out of the evil world that Satan presides over. So look again at verse 15. You Christians do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. The world is the system. The things or the things that we see every day that we know are worldly and displeasing to God. That's what the world is that John says we are not to love. It is under the domination of Satan. It is an evil to the core, and it is in opposition to God. Now, be sure you get this. For Christians, worldliness does not happen overnight. If a, if a Christian becomes worldly, it's a process. It starts out with a little something and gets bigger, and it grows bigger, and it grows bigger, and it grows bigger. Doesn't happen overnight. But anything that is opposite to Christ, anything that is opposite to God, anything that is opposite to his word is worldly. And John says, do not love the world. Now, as I see it, and I think I understand the Bible says it this way, that of all the things that can happen in a Christian's life, this may be the most insidious of all, to become worldly, to enjoy the things of the world, to enjoy the pleasures of the world, to enjoy the things that are really in opposition to God. Don't love the world, he said. Now, Jesus taught them, his disciples, you're going to be in the world, but you're not going to be of the world. And the best illustration that I've ever heard of that is this. Down in my hometown of Mobile, Alabama, they make ships. They build ships. And right over in Mississippi at Pascagoula, they build a lot more. They build ships down there. What do they build ships to do? To sail in the water. Now, when a ship 
it's in the water, that's the best place for a ship to be. But when the water gets in the ship, that's trouble. So if we Christians are in the world, good, because our influence is supposed to be for Jesus. Being in the world is important for a Christian, but when the world gets into the Christian, that's when it's trouble. Like the water in the ship. Okay? So what is a Christian to do about worldliness? Well, John starts out by saying, don't love the world. Don't love the world. The world will lead you astray. The world will weaken you. The, the world will take away your witness. The world will lead you away from a commitment to doing God's will in your life, the world of evil. And he says that there are three approaches that Satan takes in leading people into worldliness. Next verse. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So, worldliness is summed up in three phrases. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What do you mean by all that? The lust of the flesh means the base desires that the flesh has out of the will of God. Whatever the base desire of the flesh is outside the will of God, that's what worldliness is. It's letting the desires and the uh, the calls of the flesh displace the will of God in our lives. Whatever leads you and me away from the will of God is the lust of the flesh. We think of that when we read that, since it has the word lust in it, we think of sexual sins. That's true, but that's only one. You see, anything that is opposed to the will of God and the fleshly desire that the, that the devil takes hold of and turns it away from God is the lust of the flesh. And it can be the love of money. It can be the love of pleasure. It can be a lot of things. Okay. The second one is the lust of the eyes. That probably is where Satan usually starts. He makes the world look good. He makes it appear like it's something you ought to have. So the lust of the eyes is worldliness. If Satan can convince us by just an image or something that he can cause us to imagine and we can see in our mind's eye that leads us away from the will of God, the lust of the eyes. 
The third thing is the pride of life. What is the pride of life? It's egotism and putting self on the throne and taking God off the throne. The pride of life is my saying, I want what I want, and I want it now, and I will do as I please. It is making self the most important person and not God, the pride of life. It's an egocentric approach to living. It is always thinking in terms of me, mine, and my. And unseating God from the throne of our lives and putting ourselves there. The pride of life. Some New Testament scholars have gone far enough to say that pride is the root of all other sins. And maybe there's some truth in that. Maybe there is. What was it that made Adam and Eve sin in the garden? It was pride because Satan said to them, God knows that if you eat of that fruit, you'll be wise like he is. See, so he appealed to their pride. And it may be true, folks, that sin begins with pride. When I want my way, I want my will, and I'm going to do it my way. Instead of saying, I want God's will, and I want to do it God's way. So let's look at those two verses now together. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Hmm. And now he's going to give them in the next verse the reason why we should not let the world control us. Look at verse 17. The world passes away and the lust thereof. So whatever the world has to offer is already passing away. That's what it means. It is now passing away. And there will be a time when everything that is worldly will be cast into hellfire. Okay? So the person who gives himself to the world and lives for the world is living for something that won't last. It's passing away. But look at the other part of that verse. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So every person chooses. Will I go the way of the world or will I go God's will way? If I go the way of the world, I'm giving my life to something that won't last. It's going to pass away. But if I give my life to the will of God, I'll live forever. Wow. That's the contrast and that's the choice that we all have. So to sum up, the world is anything that opposes God. It is a system of evil under the domination of Satan. 
It is with us still and will be until the end. It manifests itself in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it is passing away. It's not going to last. Because in the end, all evil is going to be destroyed. Don't you believe that? In the end, God is going to put Satan and everything Satan has into hellfire. Everything. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's why it's so wonderful to be a Christian. That's why it's so wonderful to know that we belong to him. We're not perfect. No, a long ways from that. We won't be until we get there. But we are his children by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to underscore the last part of that verse. It is the heart of what John is trying to say to us. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And we believe that, don't we? Yes, we believe that. So test number five is, what do you think about the world? Added to the other four, John has now given us five ways to know that we're saved. How we deal with our sins, that's first. Whether we're walking in the light or in the darkness, that's second. Or are we seeking to be obedient, that's third. Do we love other Christians, that's fourth. And now, how do you feel about the world? And I'm sure you have passed all five of those tests. And I'm not being facetious. I mean that. And John said, this is how you know you've been born again. Because you're on the right side of these five things. I told you when we started that you're going to enjoy First John. I also told you that at times he's going to step on our toes. And he'll do that right to the end. But I love this book. I, I've, every time I've ever taught it, I love it a little bit more. It is a wonderful book for Christians on the assurance of salvation. So much in it, so much in it. And I hope that it will be a blessing to you.